Good afternoon. Welcome to the University of Minnesota and the third Bob Kim Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture. The Bob Kim, the Bob Kim and the Griffin, uh, Bob Kim Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture Fund was created in 2004 by Bob and Kim Griffin with a donation of 500,000 U.S. dollars to the University of Minnesota China Center. The Griffin's gift reflects Bob and Kim Griffin's commitment to promoting mutual respect between two distinct and diverse cultures. The gift also reflects their passion to connect peoples between the U.S. and China. We appreciate their visionary support of the University of Minnesota China Center. And Mr. Griffin and I share many common interests about American and the Chinese cultures and values. We both see that many years from now, as I talk about this year, you know, last year I talked about this two years ago, and we want to see our next generation, the next, next generations from both the U.S. and China can work side by side to, to make the world more peaceful and share common values. And the Griffin International Companies is a marketing firm that helps create the private la label electronics and the video games accessories for major retailers. It had a revenue growth rate of 370% in two, and ranked the third fastest growth private company in Minnesota in 2005. And now I'd like to invite Mr. Bob Griffin, President and CEO of Griffin International Companies, to the podium. Bob. Thank you, Hong, very much. I think we may sh maybe should make the name of this lecture series a little shorter so it's a little easier to say. Uh, uh, thanks again, Hong, for that nice introduction. I also want to thank all of you for coming today to this lecture series. This lecture series, as Hong said, is dedicated to the mutual respect and understanding of Chinese people. And the hope is that we as American citizens can open our minds to the understanding and differences between China and the U.S. so that we can enjoy a positive relationship with those that we call our friends in China. The last year we were captivated by the words of Dr. Arthur Rolnick, who is the senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank. He argued that we should be celebrating and applauding, not fearing or criticizing Chinese economic progress. He described how China has raised over 200 million people out of abject poverty. He also concluded that more and more trade means more and more growth. And that's not just true of China, but also India, which I'm excited to say we're going to hear more about today, and I'm actually looking forward to our guest speaker. However, before we hear from him, I want to again thank Dr. Yang for another great year of leadership at the China Center here at the Minnesota. Uh, he and his staff have ha added many new corporate sponsors, uh, led a number of business delegations uh, to China, instructed and escorted several education delegations, just to name a few. So I'd just like to take a moment to applaud Dr. Yang and his staff for a wonderful job at the China Center. <laughs> I'd also like to say, as Hong said, uh, I'd also like to thank my employees at Griffin International Companies. Our company's had some phenomenal growth over the last five years, and it's due to their hard work. And uh, what's great for me is I get to see them build bridges every day. So it's really a wonderful place to be. Lastly, I'd like to thank my family uh, for allowing me to make so many trips to China every year. Some of them get quite long. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank my wife, uh, who, lo whose love and devotion to our family, her ideals, and her appreciation of China is uh, second to none. So thank you again for attending the, uh, the annual lecture. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Hong to uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, Senator Pogominer, uh, Senator Majority Leader uh, Elect of State, uh, Minnesota's uh, Senate. And uh, Senator Pogominer will introduce our speaker. Uh, Senator Pogominer is our longtime friend and supporter of the University of Minnesota China Center. Larry. 
My only qualification for here is that I have attended these lectures, and uh, I have found them all to be extremely interesting, and I know many of you have attended. Those of you who have not will find that it's, uh, it's a fabulous thing that the Griffins have done here. Uh, Peter Botlier is an international economist, China scholar, and consultant. He's currently an adjunct professor at Hopkins University Advanced International School of Advanced International Studies, serves on as, as a senior advisor on the conference board. And if you're an economist, you know what that is. It's a big deal. Uh, he's the author of many articles on economic reforms in China. He's previously been with the World Bank in a variety of uh, positions. He's been an advisor for East Asia. He's held positions with, in Latin America, in Africa, been division chief in Mexico, and has been a resident chief economist in Indonesia. So he's, he has expertise around the world. He's been a research fellow at Brookings, but in addition he's had what some would say real world experience when he was chief economist and marketing director at the Zambian State Copper Company, Lusaka, Lusaka. He's educated at Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam, and MIT. The importance of this lecture is that India and China make up about 40% of the world's population. And I think the observations and his uh, thoughts on India's growth in the context of the Chinese experience is going to be both timely and important for us. I'll give you Dr. Botlier. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Senator Hogemiller, for introducing me so kindly. And selling, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Griffin, for sponsoring this event through this uh, foundation. Thank you, Dr. Yang. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to make a presentation in this distinguished series on the subject that is of great interest, I think, to most of you, all of you, China. So if China is the subject of this series of presentations, why on earth should anyone wish to listen to something about India? Well, that is the question I have to ask myself first and answer. Uh, China's rise in the global economy has been so astonishingly quick and impressive. It's very hard to keep up with that. It's China's growth has outpaced the most optimistic projections that were made by the experts consistently. Period after period, China has outdone even the most optimistic uh, projections. But until recently, I think it wasn't fully clear what was the implication of that. Um, when I was rereading an article by Gerald Siegel, who was the Director of International Strategic Studies in London uh, and wrote an article in Foreign Affairs magazine only seven years ago, 1999, I was astonished to read there that in his judgment, and mind you, that judgment was still widely shared in 1999, he said, Gerald Siegel, China is a small market that matters relatively little to the world, especially outside Asia. That was 1999. That was Foreign Affairs, one of our most distinguished journals on international politics. We know better today. Uh, China's economy has, of course, as you all know, become very large and has become to influence uh, not only countries around it in Asia but around the world what is happening in Mexico, the unemployment in Mexico, the disappearance of the maquiladora industries is not unrelated to what is going on in China. Yet few people, I think, have focused in a systematic, comprehensive way on China's global economic impact. Even the China scholars, which I am trying to become, I think have to broaden their focus we can no longer be satisfied just trying to understand what's going on inside China. We have to also understand China's impact around it, 
in, in Asia and around the world. The country I want to focus on today is India. It's a very special case, but a very important one. Not because India and China are so close, they are not. But because India is the other big giant in Asia in the world. And between them, they account for almost 40% of world population. India and China do not have much in common historically, culturally, politically, or economically. But both nations have become hooked on rapid growth. For those of you who follow the statistics, in the last quarter, the Indian economy, that is the quarter that ended September, was growing at 9.2%, an all-time record for India, but still not quite as high as China's. China is still, at the moment, growing at over 10%. The difference is getting narrower and narrower. Both no nations have become hooked on rapid growth as a way out of poverty and to gain international respect. India is deeply affected by China's economic success and is keenly interested in demonstrating to itself and to the world that it too can grow fast. Although hard to prove, I am convinced that China's example is an important factor in India's economic liberalization and newfound confidence since they began the process of economic liberalization in the early 90s. You will not find any Indian government documents which explain that they're doing certain things because China has gone ahead and because China was successful. But if you are in India, you meet with business circles and academics or government people in Delhi, as I do, did for, most part, for a good part this summer, China is not far below the surface in almost all conversations I have. There is no public acknowledgement of the example effect of, in, of China in India, but it is palpable when you talk to the business people there. The world, of course, is fascinated by Asia's renaissance and the idea that India and China together uh, may learn to work together and rise together because it will change the world like few other factors uh, in this century. Although their de development models are very different, India and China are now the two largest, uh, and f not the two largest, the two fastest growing economies. And if that continues for another few decades, it will completely change the global economic landscape. The British historian Angus Madison projects that the combined share of India and China on a purchasing power uh, basis uh, will rise to 35% in about uh, 20, 2025 and possibly to their share in the global population that is 40% only a decade later. That will be totally different. That will create totally different dynamics in global economic relationship than we have at the present time. As I mentioned, I had the opportunity to study the Indian economy during the summer, it was my first visit to India. I, of course, like everybody else, read about India, and I'd been at Indian airports, but never had the chance to really visit the country and talk to the people seriously. And uh, it was a real interesting experience for me. Um, much to my surprise, I found that the interest in China is really quite strong everywhere I went. Maybe the trade numbers uh, explain part of that, uh, Indian interest in China. Uh, India, China became India's third largest trading partner in 2003 and moved to second place after the United States last year. This is a, a really important development. The two most populous nations now in the world, China already the second largest trading partner of India gone virtually unnoticed in the American press. But for India, China is much more important than the reverse at this point. About 12 to 15 percent of India's exports goes to China. Only 1.2 percent of China's exports go to India. Yet, surprise, surprise, India has a trade surplus with China. Contrary to what I had expected, based on the many press reports on India and China, I found that the perceptions of China in India are less dominated by fear or suspicions than 
by curiosity and by a desire, certainly on the part of the business community, to understand better what's going on in China in order to be able to take advantage of that. Many Indian firms are exploring opportunities for trade and investment in China. According to statistics that I just saw yesterday, some 57 Indian firms, they're all large firms, are already invested in China. And 27 Chinese firms, mostly state-owned firms, are already invested in India. And this is the beginning of a process, in my opinion. We, will, we haven't seen anything yet once this gets going. The enormous economic complementarities between the nations that can be exploited for, for mutual benefit. Many Indian firms are not only investing in China, but also importing from China uh, under the liberalized import regimes in India. And initially, this was seen with a great deal of apprehension on the part of the Indian government and the business community, because they were all fearful that the super competitive manufacturing industries in China would rapidly wipe out the competing manufacturing sectors in India. It didn't happen. What happened is that many of the Indian manufacturing sectors that were exposed to competition with China actually pulled up their socks and increased their productivity enormously. And you see a lot of dynamism in the manufacturing sector in India at the moment, in part, I am sure, because of the opening of the Indian economy to global imports, but especially to imports from next door, China. The gradual opening to import from China since the early 80s has generated many more opportunities than problems in India. Uh, although India has, many, has launched many anti-dumping cases against China more than against any other nations, the trade between them is, is expanding very rapidly. I gave you some numbers already. The trade, the bilateral trade between India and China in the aggregate last year was close to $20 billion, which is still peanuts relative to China's total external trade, but it is not peanuts for India's external trade. India is a much smaller trader, as you know, than, than China is. But the important thing to notice is that the rate of expansion of that bilateral trade is phenomenal. It has been 60% per annum in the last five years. That means that the bilateral India-China trade is, fa is ex expanding more than twice as fast as the external trade of either country. So that's where a lot of changes are going to occur in, in that bilateral relationship. When President Hu Jintao visited India uh, last month, I believe it was, uh, they, the two countries agreed that uh, this was a good thing and that they would set a doubling of their bilateral trade to $40 billion by the end of this decade as, an, as a target. Normally, when China sets a target, then it exceeds that target. That is my experience. So to compare the Indian and the China's economies, which is uh, to a large extent the object of my presentation here, uh, it is important that uh, China scholars um, learn more about what's going on in, China, in India at the same time. And to make that comparison to start, I think it's useful to look a little bit uh, at the history of India's uh, economic growth since that country's independence. During the first three decades, there wasn't much growth in India at all. Uh, India is a heavily socialist country, really orienting itself more on the Soviet Union than on the Western countries. It um, didn't quite emulate totally the, the central planning ex experience of the Soviet Union, Russia in particular, uh, but it came very close to it. Consequently, uh, the growth rate in India remained very modest for decades after independence, r rarely above the population growth rate. So per capita income stagnated for decades after India. And current economists uh, in India mockingly refer to that Indian old Indian growth rate uh, as the Hindu growth rate. But things began to change already in the 1980s. In the 1980s, um, they began to 
changed the business environment for companies. They removed some restrictions. It wasn't very comprehensive like China has done, but it, it did affect the growth rate. And f during the 1980s, Indian growth rose to about 5.5% compared to 3% in the preceding three decades. This growth rate rose to 6% in India in, during the 90s as the economy was partly opened up to foreign trade and investment. India began to open up in 91, essentially, when the country experienced a very severe balance of payments crisis. China began to open up much earlier, at least, I would say, uh, at least a decade earlier. In the early 90s, China already began to open up to foreign investment, not yet so much to trade. But India started in 91. The growth in response to that economic liberalization in India accelerated to 7% in the last three years. It is expected to exceed 9% in the current year. And in fact, if the 9.2% growth rate of the last quarter continues, they may, they may actually ac exceed their own target. So this is a new ball game. The relations between the two countries are increasingly important at the economic level, financial level, but also at the political level. Government-to-government uh, -government contacts are also on the rise. Um, that doesn't mean, and I didn't sense that when I visited India, that there is any great deal of friendship between the two nations. I didn't sense that at all. They're very different, and they're sort of holding a distance from each other. But there is a remarkable pragmatic determination on the part of both governments to avoid bilateral problems, and they still have some, from getting out of hand. And this is something the Griffin Foundation is familiar with, building as many bridges as possible between them. And let me give you some examples of that. In the last year alone, there have been three very important government-to-government -government agreements between India and China. They are now jointly funding and staffing parallel high-tech research institutions in Beijing and in New Delhi. This was agreed upon earlier this year. This will be high-tech research mainly at mass consumer goods, at adopting technologies to poor countries like India and China. The second initiative was to lay a foundation for a strategic partnership, joint military exercises, training, military to military contacts. Sounds very strange in American ears, perhaps, because many people in Washington think that you could put a ring around India by doing a civilian nuclear deal with uh, a, a ring around China by doing a civilian nuclear deal with, uh, with India. When you talk to the Indians about that, they completely discount the possibility that they would behave in the way that some people think they might behave, nam namely by agreeing to build around fence about China, not at all. Uh, for them, even though there is not a friendship right now between the two nations, they both realize that they are going to be the biggies in this century and that anything that uh, would get them on a slippery, slippery slope of deteriorating bilateral relations would be very dangerous to both of them. So they're not going to let that happen, and the agreements therefore include an agreement for military to military uh, partnership and uh, with the objective to build a strategic partnership. The third agreement, uh, that's also it's got virtually unnoticed in the Western press, is to jointly bid for foreign energy contracts. Not for all but they formed a joint company that would allow them to put in bids for major oil and gas reserves around the world on a joint basis. Uh, they bid successfully just a few months ago for an American company in, Cal in uh, Colombia, South America. They jointly bid $800 million for that company, for a 50% share in that company, and they won the bid. So that's the first illustration of joint operations in the energy field because they both realize that they're going to be enormously dependent on imported oil and gas, as you have seen from some of the slides, for, you, for those of you who came in early. And rather than competing each other out of the docket, they, they want to do things jointly where that is practical. Now, let me take the discussion on India-China 
relations uh, a little bit further and make some comments on the gross performance in both countries. Uh, we all know that China has grown faster than India, but what about the quality of the growth? Uh, several of my colleagues, uh, I'm an academic now, I'm a recycled World Banker, as you heard, uh, uh, so I can refer to academics as my colleagues now. Several have uh, maintained or uh, positioned that the quality of growth is superior in India uh, because it, the statistics show less social inequality and the pollution, the uh, environmental deterioration in India is less severe than it is in China. But I am not so convinced that that is a, uh, that that's a true statement. Uh, surely environmental degradation in China is very severe and probably on average much more severe than in India. But we should also remember that the manufacturing sector which is responsible for much of the pollution is many times larger in China than it is in India, not just two or three times, but about 10 times as large in terms of total output, so that's a factor. In terms of social equality, yes, the statistics, if you look at the Gini coefficient, for example, as a measure of income distribution, the Gini coefficient for India shows remarkable stability at about 0.33 in the last few decades, whereas in China, it's going through the roof. China is now as unequal in terms of income distribution as the United States is, if not worse, f coming from an egalitarian society. But I am not so sure that the statistics uh, are measured, uh, do measure the Indian situation correctly. An Indian professor at the University of California recently pointed out in the Financial Times that the Indian genie actually measures something different from what the Chinese genie measures. The Chinese, mini, the Chinese genie measures indeed income differentials, but the Indian genie measures consumer spending differentials, which are two very different things. And if you go to India, and you see the tremendous poverty, both in rural India and in urban India. It is hard to imagine that from a social equality point of view, uh, China is uh, so much inferior to India. In fact, on the basis of windshield kind of empiricism, I would be inclined to say that uh, India is at least as unequal socially as China is. And of course, I'm not even speaking about the caste system, which tends to reduce social mobility in the Indian society, a problem that China not have. Uh, with the privatization of urban housing in China and the liberalization of the urban household registration system, social mobility in China uh, actually has become quite large. And that includes upward social mobility. Upward social mobility, the ability of people who start low in life to work up the ranks is actually measured to be very, very good now in China, uh, which India do still doesn't have. What about GDP size? Well, India's uh, economy is now growing very fast, but in, in the aggregate, it is still very much smaller than, than China. Uh, the populations are not so very different anymore, 1.2, 1.3 billion people, and the Indian population is likely to exceed China's population in the next several decades. Uh, but the Indian GDP is only about one-third of China's at this point. And Indian per capita income measured on an exchange rate basis is uh, only about 40% of China's. Now, that is striking because about 25 years ago, India and China had about the same level of per capita income. So what explains the large difference in their economic growth performance since that time? And I've try to identify a number of key factors that, say, for the past several decades, I'm talking about the past now, may explain why China has run ahead of India so far, even though they were about the same level in uh, 20, 25 years ago. The first factor, in my opinion, is, uh, that is very important, is that the uh, e initial rural reforms that were introduced by Deng Xiaoping, or was sanctioned by Deng Xiaoping in the late 70s, had enormous income benefits, generated enormous income benefits for a majority of the Chinese population, the farmers at that time. That was, whether it's a stroke or luck or, or brilliant political 
judgment, I don't know, but nothing of the sort has happened in, in India. You haven't had an, an Indian reform yet that has created really massive income gains for the majority of the population. Yes, there are many rich people in India, but you don't have this very massive improvement of living standards at the lower ends of the society like you saw in China in the, 70, in the late 70s and uh, 80s. Second factor uh, I would identify is that uh, India's I initial economic reforms were in the 80s, uh, were initially really designed to make life easier for corporations. Uh, and several, of course, India is m much more a private economy than China is, uh, took advantage of that, but, and it created some employment, but again did not have the massive uh, income gains for a large share of the population like we saw in China. The third factor I'd like to draw your attention to is the role of females in the economy. In China, as all of you who have traveled in China know, there is very little distinction between males and females in the labor force, although with the marketization of the economy, these distinctions are coming back into the system. Uh, but certainly from, say, under Mao Zedong, there was complete equality between the sexes. China was probably the first economy that had an EPA without ever uh, equal rights amendment uh, without ever having this in, in on, the, on the legal books. It was a political decision by Mao Zedong. In India, the average uh, female labor participation rate is only about 27%. In China, it's 77%. That means females contribute to economic development in a much more pervasive way in China than is the case in India. The numbers are even more strikingly different in urban areas. In urban areas, female labor participation in China is 75%. In India, it's lower than the average. It's only about 15%. Married Indian women don't work outside the house. Still a cultural treat that you don't see in China at all. The fourth factor I would like to identify that probably has had a lot to do with the differential gross performance is the savings behavior. The Chinese save a lot more than the Indian do. At the national level, the Chinese savings rate is now of the order of uh, 44, 45, even 46 percent. Some people say even 50 percent. Uh, in India, it's improving, and it is not bad compared to the average of many developing countries, but it's barely over 30 percent. That means that China has been able to generate a massive amount of domestic investable resources which were invested, which uh, is not true to the same extent in India. That does not mean, incidentally, that the households in China save a lot more than the households in India. Households in India actually save a lot more, but at the aggregate national level, savings performance is a function of three parties, the households, the government, and the corporations, right? When the households save at about the same rate in the two countries, the difference in the aggregate savings rate between China and India is entirely due to the fact that China's government saves a lot more. China's government invests a lot in infrastructure, but when you calculate the savings rate, it is the difference between all their recurrent budget expenditure uh, income all the tax revenue and what they spend on recurrent revenues, and that's about 6 or 7% positive in China. It's about 6 or 7% negative in India. So that's a huge factor. And, of course, the corporate sector in China uh, may be less well-developed than in India, but it is much, much larger, and in the aggregate, extremely profitable. Uh, it, the Chinese corporations, uh, on top of that, plow back most of their income, Chinese state corporations for, for 10 years haven't paid a penny in dividends. This is beginning to change now. All the money was re reinvested in, in the same corporations or in new ventures. Uh, Indian corporations, by uh, contrast, I think, have been paying dividends and on the aggregate have been saving much less. The fifth factor I would like to identify is the labor, for, uh, the labor market. Surprise for a... As a it may come as a surprise for a communist country, 
which is, in my opinion, communist in name only. I don't know why they bothered to keep that name because there's nothing, nothing communist about China anymore. Um, but uh, it's interesting that China's labor laws, a country that calls itself so communist, are much more flexible than in India. In India, you cannot lay off people even if you are about to go bankrupt. It's extremely difficult. Very hard to get discipline in the, in the workforce if you cannot uh, lay off people. Uh, China has no minimum wage laws. Uh, China has flexibilized the urban, uh, the rural to urban migration enormously by flexibilizing the household, the urban registration system. And I think the, f the much more flexible Chinese labor market is another factor which underpins the much higher growth rate, at least in the past. The next factor I would like to draw your attention to is that the Chinese have been paying much more attention than the Indians to the development of basic infrastructure. And because their savings rate was so much higher than in India, they have also put their money where their mouth is and built modern infrastructure. China, India has almost no modern infrastructure. China's infrastructure is beginning to approach Western levels. China is building an interstate highway network system like in the United States started under Eisenhower in the 50s. Uh, China's system is already halfway complete. China has modern airports, state-of-the-art airports all over the country. Um, in India, it, it's coming, but it will take another 10 years, I would guess. I mean, there's a lot of attention focused on this issue now. If you look at the cities, they look pretty horrible in both countries, but they're much more efficient in China than they are in, in India. Uh, look at uh, the delivery of, of, say, basic social services uh, like garbage collection. It's much better organized in the Chinese cities than in the Indian cities. Uh, there's water shortage in China, sure, in many parts of uh, the, the dry plains in the, in the middle northeastern part of the country. But still, most cities in China have 24-7 water supply. There is not one single city in India that has 24-7 water supply. Electricity is another factor. Uh, there have been shortages of electricity in China in recent years, but the blackouts, the brownouts were organized. The corporations were told ahead of time when they would be shut off. No such thing in, China. in India. The, 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 the power is off and on all the time. Um, the cor consequently, almost all corporations and even households, urban households of people who can afford it, at least in India, um, have to have uh, standby generating capacity in order to keep things going. And of course, that adds enormously to costs at the national level. India's infrastructure deficiencies are most visible, as I mentioned, uh, in the urban areas. Uh, with the possible exception of New Delhi, not old Delhi, but New Delhi, there are no large cities that meet the logistical and housing requirements of modern international corporations in India. Urban services and traffic congestion are so bad in Indian cities, at least the ones that I have visited. Uh, that it is often cheaper for the large Indian corporations, and they have good large corporations, to build their own cities outside. They, 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 they buy cheap agricultural land, simply set, their own, set up their own cities. Uh, there are satellite cities to, to Bangalore, to Mumbai, to uh, Chennai. Uh, that's the way to do it, because you cannot rely, uh, as a large corporation that has to be international competitive, on the on the services in the existing cities. That is not the case in uh, China. Um, however, there are other areas where India actually is ahead of China. Um, and I already alerted or uh, uh, mentioned the relatively highly developed corporate sector in uh, India, private corporations. Uh, India has many more large, successful private corporations, purely private corporations, than uh, China has. Um, the standards of corporate governance in India are reported to be substantially better than in China, even though in China everybody is now talking about corporate governance. The average performance on that score is still pretty low. Uh, 
India also has better integrated uh, uh, domestic capital markets, particularly the equity markets. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, when he allowed the equity markets to get off the ground in, uh, in China in, the, in 1990, uh, wanted to marry capitalist and socialist concepts. He said, all right, try the, the stock exchange in Shanghai. If it doesn't, doesn't work, we'll close it again. And of course, they made many mistakes, I think, in the first 10 years of the Chinese stock exchanges. The Indian stock exchanges are not only much older, but also, I think, more mature in the sense of uh, quality of supervision, and uh, particularly regarding the, uh, the rule of law culture that governs business contracts uh, in India is much more highly developed than in China. India is a rule of law country. I mean, there is a culture of rule of law. China is still, I think that's still a fairly distant dream in China. So these are clearly areas where, where India has the edge over China. Many large Indian corporations, as you know from simply following the press, have uh, branched out internationally. Uh, they're very active in mergers and acquisitions in Europe, in Latin America, but the Chinese companies are now also becoming very active. But in terms of mer international mergers and acquisitions, the Indians are also ahead of the uh, Chinese. It is a bit of a surprise, was a surprise to me, when you note that the rated Governance, corporate governance standards in India are superior to those in China, that the rated indicators of the ease of doing business, business indicators, are much better in China than in India. It's a bit of a paradox. It's much, even though it may be difficult to do business in, in China, and uh, so those of you who have experience in that may can speak from personal uh, accounts, uh, but on average, it's still much easier than, than in India. Um, India and China, in terms of comparative governance indicators, not just for corporate governance, but generally for the governance of the nations, rank about equally according to the surveys that the World Bank does uh, from time to time. Uh, India ranks uh, uh, above China in three important categories, voice and accountability, as you would expect in a democracy, and a free press. China still doesn't have a free press and no, no democracy. Um, India also r rules, uh, ranks ahead of China, as I mentioned, in rule of law and in the control of corruption. China, however, ranks higher than India does in government effectiveness. This is, this is very important, and this is why doing business in India at the end of the day, in, in China at the end of the day is easier, because government in, in, in China is much more effective than it is in, uh, in India. The other two categories where China outperforms India in terms of overall governance are political stability, and regulatory quality. Political stability may surprise you. India is a democracy, so what's wrong with political stability in India? Well, basically nothing uh, at the aggregate level, but India has for decades had a domestic Maoist insurgency, which is going on in a good part of the country, particularly the northern half of the, poor northern half of the country, of a nature, a uh, in domestic insurgency, anti-government, armed people, armed bands, blowing up government buildings that you don't have in China at all. At least you have disturbances in China, but you don't have a politically motivated, large-scale insurgency uh, like you have in India. It doesn't hit the press in the United States. F few people have ever heard of the Naxalites but the Naxalites are the, basically the same people as the Maoists in Nepal, who uh, have for decades now been trying to emulate Mao Zedong's experience. And a very large group of that movement still exists in India today. Um, let me say a few words about the labor force, because there's very interesting differences here between the two countries partly as a result of the one-child uh, family policy, which China has had since the early 80s, uh, 
uh, population growth in China has slowed enormously. In India, it's still galloping ahead. Uh, demographers predict that China's labor force will peak uh, in about a decade from now, 2015, and that the total size of the labor force in China uh, will begin to level off and decline from then on. And that will undoubtedly put additional pressures, I think, on wage levels. We, at the moment, cannot foresee a date that the Indian labor force will peak because the total population is still expanding at a pretty, pretty high rate, somewhere between 2 and 3 percent. The China's population growth rate may be at best 1 half percent at the moment. And once the Chinese population has peaked, which most people expect to happen in between somewhere between 230, 2030 and 2040, and the labor force will peak well before that, of course, many things will begin to change because China will then begin to age very quickly, probably faster than China, Japan is already today. Now, some people argue that because India's labor force is projected to grow much faster and eventually probably larger, especially if the female participation rate increases, that India has an enormous demographic dividend that somehow will allow India to outpace uh, China in the long run. Then, theoretically, of course, that is right. Labor force growth is economically easier than labor force decline to deal with. Uh, but there is no guarantee at all that labor supply will equate uh, labor demand. The unfortunate thing in India is that most of the poorer states in the north ha northern half of the country have the highest population growth rates and the least economic growth. So in India, you get tremendous labor supply precisely in the area where there is very little going on in terms of investment or economic development. So this so-called demographic dividend that India enjoys, I think, yes, is potentially very important uh, and could eventually lift Indian economy over the Chinese economy. But there is no guarantee at all, unless the Indians can change their development model to become much more labor absorptive than it is at the present time. And I will conclude with some remarks later on on, on that key aspect. Be of difference between the two countries. Now, uh, talking about similarities and differences, uh, I've uh, not deliberately overlooked, but it is, of course, uh, important to stress that politically the two countries are very different. Uh, China is a unitary state uh, with an, uh, basically an authoritarian government uh, style. And uh, India is a uh, federal republic like the United States uh, with a, a pretty highly developed democratic system. India is a truly democratic country, in my opinion. Um, does that mean that China is not fundamentally also democratically inclined? I, I think at the popular level, uh, the popular individual family people level, I would think that uh, the, Indian, the, uh, the Indian people are not more democratic than the Chinese people I individually. Uh, I'm personally hopeful that democracy will eventually come to China, but when and how, I don't know. I think uh, don't hold your breath for a big bang democ democratization in, in China. Like everything else, it will help. It will, if it happens, will happen gradually, and you may not even notice much about it until it has happened. Um, but this is very different because one of India's most famous economists, Amartya Sen, who teaches at Harvard right now, uh, he won the Nobel Prize uh, for economics just a few years ago. And one of his key dictums, his lesson, lessons, is that development is a process of expanding the real freedoms that people enjoy. That is Amartya Sen's definition of development. Now, if we buy into that, and I think many of us do, then we must conclude that China's model, political system, cannot continue to contribute to the development of the society indefinitely, because sooner or later the Chinese families, the Chinese individuals, are going to put uh, place a, very, a, a much higher premium on political liberty than they do at the present time. 
And this is interesting because Amartya Sen is very famous in China. Amartya Sen's books are read, are read in Chinese at Chinese universities and are being gobbled up. So this, this is a very important area where India and China are interacting, not at the government to government level, but sort of at the academic level. A few comments just for interest, not because it really is terribly important, on the U.S. relationships with China as compared to the U.S. relationship with India. They are, both, they are important in both cases, but uh, it's important to, to, re to, to realize that the, the merchandise trade of the U.S. with, uh, with uh, China was more than 10 times as large as with India. Uh, last uh, year, the, the total of the imports and exports between the two countries, $285 billion, and the total U.S. trade with India both ways it was only $26. And on top of that, the trade with uh, China is growing much faster than the trade with India. They're growing fast in both cases. But in the last five years, trade with, uh, with, with China has grown almost 150%. And that's against 86% with India. So fast in both cases. But the, the order of magnitude difference between them, I think, is something the politicians uh, in Washington should bear in mind. Uh, I'm all in favor of very good, positive relations between the U.S. and India. But the notion somehow that that could serve to put a ring around China is a totally faulty and potentially dangerous one, in my opinion. That's why I bring this up. Strikingly, both countries are about, have about the same degree dependent of dependency on the U.S. market. US, China, according to Chinese export statistics, which are not the same as U.S. trade statistics, Chinese exports about 21% uh, to the U.S., the exact same percentage for India. So the relative dependence is about the same, but the total volume of the trade U.S. Uh, China trade is about 10 times as large. Now, some people have argued that whereas China is growing faster, India is making a more efficient use of its investment resources because in the last few years, for every dollar invested in India, they got more incremental output than China. And prima facie, I think that is an indicator uh, of a better allocation of investment resources. But to conclude from that, that India investment or India resource use is more efficient than in China, I think is stretching it a little bit. I've gone back to the early 80s and calculated what the economists call the incremental capital output ratio for both countries. And I found that yes, in the last few years, India outperformed China. But for most of the preceding two decades, they were about dead even. And that's just investment resources. If you look at total use of public resources, then my inclination is to think, to say, that China may have the edge in resource use on India because India has m misallocated an enormously large proportion of its budget on ill-targeted subsidies. The power sector in India is a good example. Power in India is a sad story generally, but if you know how it is financed and how much public subsidies uh, in India flow, particularly to the rural communities, farmers in India get their, their electricity essentially free. Uh, that kind of ill-targeted subsidies uh, are no longer part of the Chinese scene at all. So from an overall resource use point of view, I am in I'm not so convinced at all that India is actually outperforming China, as some of my colleagues at MIT and other places um, have suggested. Um, the fact that India is underinvested in infrastructure, basic infrastructure, urban infrastructure, just name it, <coughs> of course, implies that there is going to be a moment at which this tremendously rapid growth uh, momentum that you now have in India may be blocked or frustrated by the lack of infrastructure. I already mentioned large Indian corporations that want to attract them, you know, first class people and uh, house them decently have to build their own cities. Uh, very expensive for them. Um, 
I would think that um, this infrastructure problem is going to be a major factor that may retard uh, India's growth in the years ahead. The Indians are aware of it. Everybody in Delhi, Delhi I talk to uh, stress the importance now of allocating resources to highways, electricity network, and so on, but they're so far behind China in, in that respect that even if they were politically fully unified and really concentrated all their policy attention and financial resources on infrastructure development, I think it, it would still take 25 years before they would catch up with, uh, with China in that respect. China is an interesting case because in many ways China is built ahead of capacity needs. Uh, well, we all know about the overinvestment in certain consumer industries and in maybe in steel and perhaps also aluminum and copper and tin and zinc. Um, and uh, when initially built, Chinese highways tend to be rather empty parking lots. Uh, but it, it, after five years, they begin to show the, the traffic density. If you see it, the major highways between Shanghai and Anhui province or even all the way to Wuhan, uh, these were initially empty roads, so they're now more than full, these roads, and that's only 10 years later. Um, <coughs> so where does that leave us? Um, who is eventually going to be the winner in international competitiveness and growth? Well, history will tell, I don't know. At this moment, I think uh, we can say that India is narrowing the growth gap with China significantly, but is still behind. And as long as you grow slower than somebody else, then you're not catching up. All that happens is that the rate at which you're falling behind is slowing down. And that is essentially the, the, the not so glamorous part of the India story. Yes, they are catching up in terms of getting to where China has been for some time in terms of national growth rate, they're not quite there yet. I, and I don't know how sustainable it is. I will make some comments. Uh, but we cannot say at this point, as some people in Washington do, that India is catching up with China. All you can say, India is slowing, is falling behind more slowly than they used to. Um, <clears throat> but I think the, the strong points that argue for a, I think, a strong performance in India are the enormously well-developed private corporate sector, quality of governance, highly developed domestic capital markets, where China is clearly behind, and what I think is now a awareness that they have fallen behind so far behind China. And that's my the theme of my presentation, the China effect in India and in many countries around in Asia is enormously important because of the example that China has set. Uh, they're all looking to China for ways to get out of poverty and to get, gain international respect. And I think that is really where the India factor, sorry, where the China factor in India is very important. So let me try to wrap this up. Um, because I, I think, because it is so important for global economic equations in the first half, of certainly uh, of this century, uh, what are the prospects that India can continue to grow at, say, the 7, 8, 9 percent? Um, my conclusion is, yes, that there are um, strong possibilities that India will continue to do well and overcome some of the the fiscal problems, the infrastructure deficiencies, uh, because there is now a momentum in this present coalition government in Delhi that sees all the shortcomings and is committed to do all the things that have to be done. But in order to make that possible, they will really have to change their growth model. We all know about the importance of the software industries in India. The, the, their IT-related services industry is indeed very highly developed probably more highly developed than in China, but that is not a basis for sustained long-term national development. It doesn't employ enough people. 
The entire modern IT sector in India employs about 4 million people, less than 1% of the total labor force. So India will have to broaden its development model. It will have to go into low-end manufacturing, like has been so important in China in the last few days, in the last few uh, decades. Uh, that is the only way in which China, uh, India, I think, can hope to generate the, the employment, the job creation that the country needs. Uh, India, on average, is still much poorer in terms of per capita income, but uh, more importantly, as I mentioned, the, the big labor force growth is precisely in the area where you have the least economic growth, and that's the potential danger. And that's the area where they have to push both low-end manufacturing and agriculture. I haven't said much about agriculture, but that's because both societies are still very heavily dependent on it for a large part of their population, but much more so in India than in China. In India, some 60% of the people are still living off the land, essentially, 60%. In China, that's now down, and by my estimate, to about 33, 35%, right? And average rural incomes, though low in China, are much better than the average rural incomes in, uh, in India. That's where the employment will have to come. India's agricultural sector, on average, over the past 25 years, had, has, has grown at between 2 and 2.5% two and per year. China's agricultural sector, over that same period, had grown between 4 and 5%, roughly double India. That is perhaps, from a social perspective, perspective, the single biggest difference in the gross performance. So India will not only have to expand into low-end manufacturing in order to create employment, but it will also have to get grips on its agricultural sector. The Indians did great in the 50s and 60s during the, cult the Green Revolution, when the country from a net food importer became uh, self-sufficient in food and even an exporter for some years. But the overall growth rate in agriculture has stagnated whereas it has been very, very high, amongst the highest in the world in China. So my two conclusions are where China really has to look to India for examples, low-end manufacturing and agricultural growth. The agricultural growth in India will inevitably involve major investments in infrastructure. Water storage capacity for irrigation is very well developed in China. It's almost undeveloped in India. China has something like 25 times the water storage capacity for irrigation that India has. India cannot capture the water. It runs off to the sea. It has limited irrigation, and the irrigation is m not very well maintained. This, I think, is perhaps one of the most important keys that is perhaps somewhat surprising where India has to learn from China. They have to invest in infrastructure, including water storage capability, including irrigation facilities. Otherwise, India will not get out of rural poverty. Thank you for your attention. Open for questions. Zhao, we have a, we have we have a microphone here. Okay. Thank you very much for a most interesting and um, challenging presentation. Uh, you touched on a subject that I think um, is. Um, of perhaps some of the deepest significance in comparing China and India. And that is, however corrupted it may have been from time to time in various dynasties, China does have a 2,500-year uh, tradition of some sort of meritocracy through Confucian uh, testing, promotion, and so on. Um, and, China, and in India has something China does not have, which I think is problematic, and that is a caste system. Um, it seems to me that those two phenomena, with, uh, phenomena without being too simplistic, are really quite pivotal in determining how effective each of these two countries is going to progress 
with regards to economic mobility and so on and so forth. Would you, in political, certainly with political mobility. There may be democracy in India, but there's very little political mobility, I think, also. Thank you. Um, I, I, I recognize uh, that what you're saying is correct. I, uh, China has, of course, as a nation, a much older history than India. India only became a nation as it is today as a result of British colonialism. Prior to that, there were semi-independent kingdoms and there was no national culture or aristocracy that could hold the country together like uh, China has been doing for 2,300 years now. Um, the caste system is a, a very important aspect, I think, of the Indian society and one that I really don't claim to have much expertise on. Um, I was puzzled by it myself. You don't really see it when you are in India. You, you have to be an Indian to know what it means. And uh, in my ignorance, I try to understand from a Chinese, from an Indian legal perspective, what the caste system was and I looked up the Indian constitution, all of which is a very long constitution, unlike China's constitution, which is very brief. The Indian constitution, to my surprise, says that the caste system will be officially abolished after 60 years. That's five years from now. The Indian constitution under Nehru was adopted in, in 1951. 60 years from there is 2011. Well, I cannot imagine, quite frankly, if the caste system is still so deeply enshrined in the Indian society today that they can do away with it in five years from now. So I think India will have to deal with that fundamental social dimension of their relationships uh, if they want to improve social mobility, labor market mobility, and social fairness. Uh, China doesn't have these problems. In China has a bit like a caste system, but it isn't a caste system. It is the system, systemic discrimination against peasants, farmers, migrants, who move from poor villages to urban areas in China, who get initially discriminated against all the time. I mean, they're just not full citizens. Uh, there is not, well, many cities are now improving on it. Uh, Shanghai and others, I think, are uh, giving access to the migrants to official school systems so as to begin to dilute these effects. But that, you might say, is China's equivalent of a caste system. One of the things we're seeing happening in China is Chinese Americans going back to China, scientists. And so a question I have about India is, are, in fact, about both countries, are they building their educational systems equally well? And uh, are we seeing the same kind of uh, movement of people back to India? Well, there, there, there have been very interesting studies on the, uh, the skill situation and the skill gaps in, in both countries. Um, Financial Times uh, wrote several long reports uh, on that in the last uh, six months. Their conclusion, the conclusion of these uh, reports is that both countries have enormous uh, skill shortages uh, in, at the higher end of the skill scale, both at the technical skills and the managerial uh, level. Uh, Indian software companies like Wipro Infosys that invest in China cannot find the, the, the highly trained Chinese software engineers to man their, to man their, their, their investments in China. Um, the educational systems are uh, in many ways deficient in both countries. Um, I think the most serious complaint that one hears against uh, the educational system in China is that there's still too much emphasis on road learning rather than learning to think for yourself. Um, I've heard that uh, the Indian system is not so deficient in that respect, but in terms of total volume of output, uh, the Indian system is problematic. It's so problematic that the, the large Indian corporations in software, for example, are now beginning to uh, do reverse outsourcing. That means they recruit Americans for 
for software jobs in Bangalore and Hyderabad. So a lot of people from Silicon Valley that uh, have moved in recent years for better paying jobs in India because the Indian universities, the famous Indian technological institutes started by Nehru already in 1950 are not putting out what the, what the economy needs. At the lower end of the educational systems, uh, I think the differences may be more striking. Uh, if you look at primary school attendance rates, they're much, much better, or completion rates, much, much better in China than in India. In India, and I don't ask me to explain it, but when you look at the statistics, it's, it's, it's uh, really amazing that uh, primary school attendance and completion rates are half of, of India's, of China's. But the thing that really intrigued me is that teacher absenteeism rates, just not turning up for the job, teaching job, is rampant in India. And I have never heard of that problem in China. Indian schools are there, but the teachers don't come up for job and because there is no way of disciplining labor in, in India. They seem somehow get away with it. And roughly one third of the teaching time at primary school in India is lost because of teacher absenteeism. It's a frightening problem. You, you have pointed out that, uh, that the rate of economic growth in India and China is very rapid. Now, if the cost of extern externalities is properly taken into consideration, could the rate of economic, the rapid rate of economic growth sustain itself. Well, I, I missed part of it. If, if, the, if, which, if which factor is taken into consideration? The externalities. Externalities? Yes. Which externalities uh, are you Oh, uh, envi uh, envi environmental okay. pollution. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a very important but very hard to answer question. <laughs> um, economists, uh, have been trying to calculate the economic impact of environmental degradation in, in China, and the conclusions are pretty horrifying uh, in terms of human health, loss of life, and uh, lung diseases. Uh, China is, uh, is a pretty uh, dangerous place to work at this point. At least uh, China has 16 of the world's most, 16 of the world's 20 most polluted cities are, are in, in China. Now, it hasn't really slowed down uh, economic growth as measured by output and value-added growth, but if you were to be able to properly account for the costs of environmental degradation, you will probably have to discount some of that Chinese growth because of the, the, the lower health standards and so on. How you do that economically, I, I don't know how you compute that in a meaningful way. The, ch the Chinese environmental degradation essentially puts the cost of it on the individual happiness and life expectancy of, in the, of individual workers. <laughs> so the society, uh, the, the, the economy as a whole doesn't really pay that cost. Individuals do in, the, in terms of living shorter or getting more miserable in, during their work days. But, uh, um, is it, 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 and, but in, we should not, so not imagine that India is without severe environmental uh, problems uh, also. Uh, they're not of the same nature necessarily. You don't have the same degree of groundwater pollution in India as you have in, uh, in China. And that's partly the effect of the China is so much more highly industrialized that it has not it's only now beginning to look at, uh, say, hazardous waste management in a more serious way. In 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was still very common. The most dangerous substances would simply be dumped on the ground next to, next to waterways and so on. I think they're going to be more serious about it in China. Now, you don't see that in India to the same degree, but that's partly a reflection of the fact they haven't really industrialized to the same degree. Uh, it's a very good question. I, I don't know how to answer it, sir. <laughs> yeah, but you will answer it later. Uh, this is going back probably to a couple of questions back. 
I'm a little surprised by your comment when you said that India became a country just as a result of the British colonialism. Because what I think what the colonialism actually gave to India was one political government, but not necessarily the, a culture. It had always been from probably 2,500 years back, it has been a pretty consistent culture, which you can figure out from its religion, its language, its culture, look at the people, how they react, and how they respond to their life's experiences. And uh, I'll be really surprised to hear that it had become one country just as a result of 200 years of colonialism. That seems to be plainly wrong. Well, thank you for that comment. And I um, apologize for perhaps conveying the wrong impression. I was limiting my comment to administrative rule of India. India has been culturally, thanks to Hinduism, a united body of nations for a very long time, predating the British uh, by uh, many, many centuries, you're quite right. Um, Hinduism is, in a sense, the glue that hel held India together, and even today is very important. What I was referring to is the, the system of government administration, what India has today. That is essentially something that is the result of British colonialism. Yeah. A question and a comment. My comment is with regard to the political system in India. Being a democracy is a major plus and a major negative because every five years, every time you have a new uh, election, the politicians have to go back to what we call voter banks. So you basically have a lot of giveaways. So today they may have a good view of the world, putting in infrastructure and so on but down the road, that's likely to change. It does every year, every time. So I don't know what, it, what you see as the impact of that occurring to this continuous buildup of infrastructure. And secondly, what would your advice be to businesses here, you know, about investing in India versus China, <laughs> if any? <laughs> On the latter point, I'm sure there are people in this audience who know much more about it than I do. Um, the, um, well, the Indian economy, uh, the Indian stock exchanges are much more open uh, to uh, foreign investment than the Chinese stock exchanges are at this point. Um, and there are also some 40 Indian companies that have ADRs in New York, I think, uh, pretty large companies. Uh, so it's pretty easy if you want to put your savings on Indian stocks uh, to do that. It's much harder, actually, in China, although you, s you, you now have, I think, a fairly large number of Chinese corporations also c listed in, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange or the Amex or the, American, uh, or the uh, NASDAQ. And there are also increasing numbers of ADRs uh, of Chinese cor corporations. You even have two index <laughs> funds, uh, exchange-traded funds, uh, related to uh, Chinese uh, stock exchange uh, prices now. Uh, so it, it's getting easier. Uh, most economic analysts uh, suggest that the corporate returns are superior in India to what they are in China. But there's a huge debate on that because uh, it, it's not easy to get accurate information on that. But th I think the conventional opinion is that uh, returns on corporate investment are better in India at this point, uh, point in time. Um, now, on the first part of your question of democracy, um, there have been endless debates, as you know, in economic circles and in political science circles on the link between democracy and economic development. And the links are not very obvious. Um, one cannot clearly say that democracies outperform non-democracies in an economic sense in the world. In fact, there are many instances to suggest the opposite is the case. Um, I, I, I'm extremely impressed by Indian democracy. I, I think it, it, this is a very hard to govern country given the enormous social complexities, the different languages. India has 18 different languages according to the constitution. China has one. I mean, to, to hold that country together and to create a sense of nationhood 
requires an art of decision making and political leadership, I think that, that is, uh, is extreme of an extremely high nature. The Indian government is extremely skilled, I think, especially the present government, in, in, in moving ahead in spite of the fact that there is so much opposition. Don't forget the current Indian government, which is a coalition government, depends on the support of large communist parties that don't participate in the government, but can pull the rug from under that government any moment they want to. Yet they manage to do things in, in, in <laughs>